Good morning, everyone. Thank you for connecting on this course um, where we talk about you know books of the Bible and we're doing Hebrews right now. We will pray and then we will continue from the scripture portion where we stopped last time. Uh, I want to request somebody to please lead us in prayer this morning. I'll pray. Yeah. Heavenly Father, thank you for this great day that you've given unto us. So we can be in your presence. I like my prayer, Jehovah, that you are willing to learn, Father, and I want it to be for your honor and glory. I commit all my fellow students into thy hands, Father, Jehovah, to give them the spirit of understanding, wisdom, and knowledge, Father. They tackle these subjects. You're learning today. Also, commit our teacher, Adam Nancy, to your hand, Father. Bless her, guide her, Father Jehovah, in all her undertaking, Father. I pray, believing in the mighty name of Jesus Christ. Amen. Amen. Thank you, uh, Kennedy. We will get back into understanding Hebrews chapter 9. I remember we stopped somewhere towards the end. Okay, therefore we so stop that. In twenty three, we completed till twenty two, um, and we saw that uh, because of the shedding of the blood of Jesus, the covenant uh, that He has made with us, the new covenant, is now now sealed. Uh, and we saw how the new covenant which has been given to us, that it was it was um, sealed not through the blood of bulls and goats or not just calves and goats, but with the blood of Jesus. And uh, that is how you know, the vessels of ministry, if you look at the Old Testament, that's how the vessels of ministry were also purified. So now we are purified by the blood of Jesus. So let's now uh, look at the section from 23 to 28 of Hebrews chapter 9. So we'll read that uh, portion and then we will uh, you know, look at the meaning of that. So could somebody read it please? Hebrews 9, 23 to 28. Shall I read, ma'am? Yes, please. Hebrews chapter 9, verse 23 to 28. Therefore, it was necessary that the copies of the things in heaven should be purified with these, but the heavenly things themselves with better sacrifices than these. For Christ has not entered the holy places made with hands, which are copies of the true, but into heaven itself, now to appear in the presence of God for us. Not that he should offer himself often as the high priest enters the most holy place every year with blood of another. He then would have had to suffer often since the foundation of the world. But now, once at the end of the ages, he has appeared to put away sin by the sacrifice of himself. And as it is appointed for men to die once, but after this the judgment, so Christ was offered once to bear the sins of many. To those who eagerly wait for him, he will appear the second time apart from sin for salvation. Amen. Amen. Thank you, Ami. So in uh, this passage, we notice how the Lord Jesus has entered into heaven. And uh, there were copies of the things in heaven, which we have understood. You know, God gave earthly copies. And um, these earthly copies, they, God had given this, this command that they should be purified. And uh, uh, one good thing that we know of now is that because of what Jesus has done, our worship, right, uh, that 
there is that purification you know, that we receive through what he has already done. So uh, we don't necessarily have to do it in a ritualistic manner. That's the point that uh, he's making. Um, so these earthly copies, they were purified. How are they purified? They are purified through sacrifices. But another point which is coming through in this section is that these sacrifices, we can't term them as imperfect. Uh, reason being, the purification, even when it was done, you know, a one-off purification was never sufficient. So if once the purification is done, um, and it, it can make the substance clean forever, then the priest would have, you know, once again purify it. Uh, but then that kept happening. But what do we see in what Jesus has done? for us we recognize that he has become our perfect sacrifice and it also talks uh, to us regarding this sacrifice being a one-off sacrifice and being perfect which is why he does not have to do it again and again for us so he has already entered the presence of god provided the sacrifice the way a high priest, an earthly high priest would do, and uh, uh, repeated sacrifices are no longer required. His sacrifice is a perfect sacrifice because it perfectly satisfied God's uh, wrath, and it has brought us that holy justice that we were seeking from the Lord. And Jesus has done it all. Now, another side note from here, which we can uh, talk about is the fact that how in some cultures and some philosophies there is a place for reincarnation and uh, the appearance of more perfect versions of you know, the so-called God figure. Um, and the reason why such philosophy exists is because they believe that the work one person has done is not perfect enough. And that God would require another person to come to uh, address, you know, salvation more completely. And so uh, there, there are uh, uh, there there are philosophies where there are all kinds of beings who uh, who are better than the previous one. But when we read here in this particular uh, uh, portion, it's pretty clear that he entered the presence of God once okay or rather he made that sacrifice once and it was perfect and uh, the author compares it to death and he says that you know as as man also dies once and after that is judgment so that's the normal that's the norm isn't it because this world is corrupted by sin we uh, our mortal mortal body undergoes decay and uh, destruction and death is something that you know it's the last enemy to be conquered um, and that happens only once now we may argue and say that there are people in scripture who have never tasted death the way uh, you know we we know it for example people like Enoch, Elijah that's a that those are exceptional cases but in general every human being tastes death once and in the same way the point he's making is that uh, that concept of once jesus has done it one sacrifice and that is more than enough for god so there is not there is no requirement for him to come and keep offering himself now when we understand this there are many other concepts actually uh, where uh, people say that uh, you know, there's, there's one more concept called courts of heaven, where uh, Jesus has, every time there is something against us, Jesus plays the role of an advocate and he fights our case. But when we look at these passages, it's very clear that whatever needed to be done was already done. And it was done once and that was sufficient for God. So it was a perfect sacrifice. Jesus no longer needs to keep fighting our battles, you know, in that sense. He has done it once. And that itself has taken care of uh, any accusation that the enemy may bring against us. The last portion of verse 28, it says, to those who eagerly wait for him, he will appear a second time 
apart from sin for salvation. So here is the reassurance that uh, we can await the second coming of Christ. But that second coming, that has nothing to do with uh, providing redemption. That has nothing to do with, with bringing salvation to mankind. Because whatever needed to be done, again, it's, it's just making it stronger. The fact that when Jesus died, you know, as uh, the Lamb of God, and uh, he was buried, he uh, was raised from the dead, with that is the completion of the redemptive work that God wanted done. So even in the second coming, it has nothing to do with the redemptive work. But that is, you know, a completely separate, uh, separate thing that God will engage in. But for us as believers, this is the reassurance that the it, the high priest whom we have. So the high priest. What is the meaning of high priest? What is the ministry of the high priest, or even a priestly ministry? Uh, it's pretty simple. We see that all the ordinances, all the regulations, the laws which were given to the priest. Uh, fell broadly in two categories. One is to uh, minister to the Lord. Uh, that would include prayer, worship. Uh, that would include, you know, gi giving of gifts, sacrifices, basically to honor God. So that is one part of what the priest is meant to do. And the second part of what a priest is meant to do is to minister to the people or serve the people. So two things, minister, serve God, serve people. And we notice that the Lord Jesus, okay, when we talk about his high priestly ministry, both are included. He did what was required to serve the people, to rescue them from the consequences of sin. And he has honored God. He has you know, worshipped God. And we know that he really walked in incredible obedience before the Father. So he has fulfilled both of these. And uh, what does that imply? You know, for a believer today, we now, you know, before the, the new covenant came into effect, which was sealed through the blood of Jesus himself, what happened is that, you know, uh, there were only some priests. But now, under the new covenant, here is the, the beautiful thing that each one of us, we are priests unto the Lord. When we study the book of uh, uh, Peter, the epistles that Peter uh, has written, we will see there. He, in fact, calls us a holy priesthood, right? So every believer now has the capacity and the opportunity to be a priest unto the Lord because of what Jesus has done. So as priest, God accepts my service to him. As a priest, you know, my service to, to uh, people, is something that is also very very important that god has given us this position we can serve god we can serve people and jesus has made it possible so uh, let me just quickly uh, let me pause here and see if there's anything uh, some of you would like to add to that if so then we can talk about it otherwise we will move on to the next passage All right, uh, we can go ahead with uh, Hebrews chapter 10. What we will do from now is let's try. Okay, it's a pretty longish passage there. Uh, okay, I was thinking we can read the entire, entire chapter. And then I just dwell on some key thoughts uh, in it so that we can make things faster. Uh, but I don't know if that would be helpful. Okay, so we'll, we'll take it as we've been doing. Uh, could somebody please read verses 1 to 3, Hebrews chapter 10? Can I read it, Pastor? Yes, Ash. For since the law has but a shadow of the good things to come instead of the true, form of this realities, it can never, by the same sacrifice that are continually offered every year, make perfect those who draw near. Otherwise, would they have not have ceased to be offered since the worshippers, having once been cleansed, would no longer have any conscience of sins. 
but in these sacrifices, there is a re reminder of sins every year. For it is important, impossible for the blood of bulls and goats to take away sins. Okay, thank you, Asha. She read uh, verses 1 through 4. Uh, and here we understand that the old covenant is a shadow of the reality, which is the new covenant, new covenant, um, uh, which came into existence much later through Jesus Christ. So you know, God has this pattern in, in, his, in, in the way he has worked. He has given shadows that point to the substance. And so the old covenant was really a shadow of the good things to come. The good thing to come would be the new covenant that uh, uh, the author is talking about. And to these Hebrew believers, you know, again, making, making it, uh, uh, helping them recognize that what has now come into existence is better and greater than their uh, you know, beliefs and their practices. That's his attempt. So that was one thing. He said that the old covenant is a shadow. And the second point he's making is again about the work of the blood of Jesus. Uh, the fact that it brings us complete purification. Okay. Uh, whereas the practices which they had, where they would work with the blood of bulls and goats, basically he's saying that if it was good enough to completely take away the uh, sin from, from any, any human being, then why would we need something new? But the better is here. Uh, obviously, the, uh, the property of the blood which was shed, right? animal blood, so he's saying it could not take away sins. Okay, that's something we have to remember. So what was the, the property or the ability of, of uh, the blood of animals? They could do something known as covering of sins. Okay, and the Hebrew word for that is kofir, only covering of sins. So it would just, uh, you know, before the Lord, that blood would cover the sin of mankind. That, that's that's about that. But now something better is in place and he is giving them an idea about the cleansing of sin, you know, taking away of sin or removal of sin uh, from an individual. So that is something new. So what is the contrast here? The blood of animals could cover the sin and that was known as atonement, but the blood of Jesus can take away sin. So uh, that is how you know, this really works. Now let's move on uh, to the next section, verses 5 through 8. Asha read till 4, so we'll read from 5. Shall I read, ma'am? Yes, yes, uh, sister, please go ahead. Consequently, when Christ came into the world, he said, Sacrifices and offerings you have not desired, but a body you have have you prepared for me. In burnt offerings and sin offerings you have taken no pleasure. Then I said, Behold, I have come to do your will, O God, as it is written of me in the scroll of the book. When he said above, You have neither desired nor taken pleasure in sacrifices and offerings and burnt offerings and sin offerings, these are offered according to the law. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, sister. So uh, here, two key thoughts that uh, we, we can grasp are, uh, one is that prophetically, now this is quoted from the Psalms. So this uh, portion here, it actually comes from Psalm chapter 40, verses 6 through 8. But prophetically, see, you see, this is something amazing uh, from the words that Psalmist spoke uh, you know, in their own lives, um, by the Spirit, they were talking probably about some other context, but you find that there is a reference to Jesus and what he would do, right, uh, in a messianic sense in many of the Psalms. So here again, 
in what is being spoken prophetically there is a message and that message is that insufficiency of earthly sacrifices and offerings needs to be noted so it's as if jesus is proclaiming the insufficiency of these sacrifices and he's also saying that god you know you have given given me a body okay as a son you have given me a body and that body how would it help you know, one is yes it helps us to experience god because jesus came to represent god uh, to us reveal the father to us so that is one but the other is that body helped him in offering that perfect sacrifice so perfect sacrifice doesn't exist god is not pleased with uh, uh, all these insufficient uh, sacrifices gifts and offerings which are being given unto the lord but something more perfect is coming and that was actually through the body of the lord jesus christ and that's the point which is being made in this section so let's go ahead now we'll read verses 9 and 10 then and then look i have come to do your will he takes away the first system in order to set up the second verse 10 it is in connection with this in this will that we have been separated for god and made holy once for and for all through the offering of yeshua the messiah's body uh thank you say uh, which version is that the complete jewish bible oh okay all right that sounded a little different from what i have here but yeah uh that was quite nice thank you uh so the key thoughts that are coming through in verses 9 and 10 uh, you know jesus uh, proclaims he says behold i have come to do your will o god so uh, he's speaking of his obedience to god and then he says uh he takes away the first that he may establish the second so the author is saying that stating that so basically he's saying because the new covenant is now in place the previous order or this can be related to the mosaic law and the mosaic order so he's saying that has now become redundant we must go by the second and the new which has been established which has to do with the the grace that has come through the lord jesus christ and in verse 10 he says uh, that we have been sanctified through the offering of the body of jesus christ once for all notice the uh, emphasis is a sacrifice but a complete perfect one time sacrifice so god is not awaiting any more sacrifices for the work of salvation to be made complete and you know for salvation to be made applicable to people and how does it help to understand this you know it really helps because nothing we can do or nothing any so called good man or uh, god man can do is required you know or, or in the first place it won't satisfy god because you know he is a holy god who is looking for a holy sacrifice but the great news is jesus has done it all he has done it once he no longer needs to do anything more and we now our relationship with god now is based on that and so he now points out to this reality uh, in christ where he states we have been sanctified okay so that is talking about the position in christ through the offering of the body of jesus i am now what i am sanctified i uh, have been made righteous in the presence of god and i can approach god so let's uh, move ahead verses 11 through 14 please verses 11 to 14 
Under the old covenant, the priest stands and ministers before the altar day after day, offering the same sacrifices again and again, which can never take away the away sins. But our high priest offered himself to God as a single sacrifice for sins, good for all time. Then he sat down in the place of honor at God's right hand. There he waits until his enemies are humbled and made a footstool under his feet. For by that one offering, he forever made perfect those who are being made holy. Okay, thank you, Say. Thank you for reading that. So again, there are pointers to the insufficiency of earthly sacrifices because there, there are words like daily, offering repeatedly, the same sacrifices. They can never take away sins. And then, you know, he comes back to the point he was making earlier about how Jesus, through his one sacrifice, he has um, now taken our sins forever. And the concept that uh, uh, Tarun was talking about in the last class, we also see that Jesus now sat down at the right hand of God. So sitting down is symbolic of completion of the given assignment. So Jesus was able to sit down. And as the earthly priests, they did not have that provision to even you know, rest in the holy place or the holy of holies because the work was not completed. But Jesus has completed the work. So uh, this passage is talking about the completion of his work and the fact that he is now seated in victory. And what does he await? We know that the earth is going through um, uh, what has been what has been set in motion. And so we have to see, uh, Satan is already a defeated foe, but then we have to see uh, see this through till the end, till you know, uh, Satan and his demons uh, and, and all the works of the enemy will be completely taken away from the face of the earth. And so we are awaiting that. And that's what this is talking about. Time waiting till his enemies are made his footstool. Was Satan already defeated? Yes, we have enough scriptures to say that the cross has defeated Satan. But we are going to see um, him take it, connect to hell. Okay, so that is the, the next part of what is going to take place as far as the judgment on Satan is concerned. So that is something we are waiting for. Uh, and then he says, for by one offering, Notice this is a very interesting uh, uh, scripture for one offering. What does it say? He has perfected forever those who are being sanctified. So earlier, what did we, we see the author saying? He told the believers, we have been sanctified. And now he's saying those who are being sanctified. But he also adds the fact that we have been perfected forever. So how do we understand this? Like, what is the author trying to say? He needs to make up his mind. Are we already sanctified or are we being sanctified? Because there are two different tenses, past tense and you know present um, uh, continuous tense. But what he's pointing to is, he's saying that in Christ, or we can look at it this way, positionally, Positionally, what is the reality about who we are? We are in Christ. We are made holy. We are made righteous. We are justified. We are sanctified. So positionally, yes, that has happened. But when he says, uh, you know, you are being sanctified, he is referring to the walk of a believer, a child of God who's walking with God, what happens in our daily life? You know, this uh, sanctification that has already been accomplished in Christ Jesus, that purity and holiness, right, that is being established in our day-to-day -day life. So there are two things and they are not contradicting each other. In Christ, many things have been established, but just because a believer is made holy uh it doesn't mean that you know 
all his acts, his words, his thoughts will be holy unless he walks with the uh, the Lord in a in a sensitive way. Right. So both are required. Positionally, the truth must be embraced, and we must also live it out in the uh, the life of a believer. So that's the point. Uh, let's move on to the next section, verses 15 through 18. I'm just going to keep going. So if you have a thought or question, just stop me. I won't uh, pause to see. 15, 15 to 18, and it reads, yes. and the Holy Spirit also testifies that this is so. For he says, this is the new covenant I will make with my people on that day, says the Lord. I will put my laws in their hearts and I will write them on their minds. Then he says, I will never again remember their sins and lawless deeds. Verse 18, and when sins have been forgiven, there is no need to offer any more sacrifices. Okay, so um, what do we see here? God is talking about uh, the new covenant where he says that he will imprint his laws upon our hearts. Okay, And there's also uh, the promise of forgiveness of sins. And uh, he's, he's referring to what the prophet Jeremiah said. He says, after those days, after those days, what, what is it uh, um, you know, pointing to? It's pointing to the new covenant. Okay. Uh, so after those days, what, what came about? The new covenant came about. And that's what uh, the context here is. So the new covenant, what else does it offer? We said that um, the law will be imprinted on our hearts and also forgiveness. So what kind of forgiveness are we talking about? We're talking about complete forgiveness under the new covenant. So no wonder uh, we, we have words such as better covenant, the good things to come, because the kind of forgiveness which is being offered is a complete forgiveness under the new covenant, where uh, God is able to remove, right, remove, uh, sit away from us and there will be no longer a requirement for any other penalty for sin. Redemption has been accomplished in this manner. Okay, so uh, that is what we understand from this section. Uh, let's move ahead. For uh, We'll read verses 19 through 25, please. Can I read Yes, Asha. Therefore, brothers, since we have confidence to enter the holy places by the blood of Jesus, by the new and living way that he opened for us through the curtain that is through his flesh, and since we have a great priest over the house of God, let us draw near with a true heart in full assurance of faith, with our hearts sprinkled clean from evil conscience and our bodies washed with pure water, let us hold fast the confession of our faith without wavering, for he who promised is faithful. And let us consider how to stir up one another to love and good works, not neglecting to meet together as is the habit of some, but encouraging one another, and all the more as you see the day of drawing near. Okay, so uh, finally, you know, talking about the high priestly ministry of Jesus, he's trying to come to a conclusion um, and uh, say that because of all these things, um, let's draw near. You know, Jesus has forgiven our sins. Uh, his blood has done the, done the work of taking away our sins. We now have an audience with God. And so try and come closer to God. So that's the point. He's coming to that. And then we'll see how he will move on to instructions about a believer's walk and a believer's life as he closes off this uh, writing very soon. Uh, so 
from now, from this section onwards, verse 19 onwards, he is trying to bring a, an encouragement and say, because of all these things, now you put your faith in God and follow after God. Don't give up, you discouraged believers. So uh, he he's saying now that having boldness to enter the holiest by the blood of Jesus. And he has explained it how, is it? So uh, he has already made it clear that Jesus has already entered, he has sacrificed, he has made us perfect. And so what can we have? Boldness. We can enter God's presence. We don't have to have um, entertain the accusations of the enemy in our mind where the enemy says, you know, uh, you're not good enough to enter God's presence because there's always this, this battle that believe, a believer may go through. Now, it is true that uh, we make mistakes, we are in error, uh, there are sins that a believer may commit. So, in our, in, within us, right, in our, in our soul, in our heart, we would need to distinguish, you know, between what really needs to be brought before the Lord and, uh, you know, uh, I, I need to ask God for forgiveness for certain matters, I need to confess my sins, those things and what the enemy actually puts in our minds. So for a believer, uh, Apostle John puts it this way. He says that if we confess our sins, that God is faithful and just to uh, remove them as far as the, he's, uh, he's faithful to forgive us our sins and remove them as far as the east is from the west. So a believer can deal with those mistakes and those sins. And then what happens? We Our conscience will be, uh, will be cleared before God and we can continue to enter the presence of God. But if a believer is so bogged down by uh, his or her mistakes and, uh, you know, things that they are not able to do right and they don't accept the forgiveness which is offered through the work of Jesus, what happens? Satan can keep them in that place of condemnation all the time. and they will lack what this author is talking about. He's talking about boldness to enter the holiest by the blood of Jesus. Because some you know, they ha have not understood what Jesus has done for them and how complete that is. And how by uh, turning back to the Lord in repentance, they can you know, have uh, their position with the Lord restored, their conscience can be cleared before God and they will continue to have boldness to enter the presence of God. Not just, you know, the uh, presence of God, but when we say the author is also pointing out here, he's saying the holiest, the holiest by the blood of Jesus. And thank God Jesus has made this way for us. Every time we can enter through this way, it's a new and living way which he has uh, dedicated it's been dedicated uh, for us through the veil that is his flesh so something was stored right in the temple the veil was stored it was symbolic of the body of jesus which was broken for us which was torn for us so a believer in our hearts we have to have this very very clear and settled that jesus has done it all to uh, to cleanse my sin that is a positional truth and then as a believer i choose to make choice uh, make decisions which will help me live out this sanctified act holy life and you know again he reminds them you have a high priest over the house of god and now comes the encouragement he says you better draw near to god with a true heart in full assurance so we can have confidence when we enter God's presence because whose work are we depending on? We are depending on the work of our Lord Jesus Christ. And he says, having our hearts sprinkled from an evil conscience, sprinkled with what? Sprinkled with the blood of Jesus. So here is uh, an indicator to the work which the blood of Jesus does for us. What does it do? The blood of Jesus has the capacity to cleanse our evil conscience, okay? Our evil conscience can be cleansed by the blood of Jesus. And we can put our faith 
in the blood of Jesus to do that work for each one of us. And he says, our bodies washed with pure water. Uh, and, you know, bodies washed with pure water, I would uh, uh, interpret this as uh, the work of the word also in our lives because he's talking along the lines of cleansing. Uh, and so the word also cleanses us and it enables us to walk righteous before the Lord. So he says, with so much confidence, we can move ahead in our faith, draw near to God, let nothing hold you back. And verse 23, he says, let us hold fast the confession of our hope without wavering for he who promised is faithful. And so he's saying, um, don't give up, but hold on. And hold on to what? You know, there is the emphasis on what we speak. Okay, so the confession of our hope. Now that is an entire teaching in itself. When, when we believe, you know, our believing then becomes our confession and our declaration and our proclamation. So he says, if you believe, then speak what you believe. Hold on to the confession of hope, of our hope without wavering. So let not words of unbelief come out of our mouth. Instead, let words of faith come out of our mouth. So our speaking is very connected to what we believe. So because we believe, let our confession also be a confession of hope. You know, when we say, yes, I'm healed by the stripes of Jesus, uh, uh, you know, through the cross, I experience deliverance, Jesus has set me free, I am forgiven. So what am I doing? I believe and therefore I'm confessing that hope which has been given to me. And so he's encouraging the believer, draw near to God, believe and make that your confession as well. Don't give up because the God who promised is faithful. And then he goes on to, I, I told us, you know, different instructions uh, about a believer's life and uh, you know community life will come up one by one. So at this point, he says, let us consider one another in order to stir up love and good works. So what is he talking about? He's talking about a, a community, a loving community, a caring community. So in times of discouragement, wouldn't it be lovely to have uh, a, a church family or a church community where we can, you know, we can find that stirring, we can find that encouragement. Okay, you know, brother, you're going through the season, but don't worry, you know, um, this is the prophetic word I got for you, or let me pray for you, uh, or uh, some sort of a help comes forth. And so he's saying, we all need this right now, and uh, let's do that step in to be there for each other and then he points to this fellowship and community life in verse 25 he says not forsaking the assembling of ourselves together as is the manner of some but exhorting one another and so much the more as you see the day approaching so once again he's saying that uh, look we need godly communities and sometimes uh, once we understand the truth of God's word and how uh, we are now members of the body individually, isn't it? We have studied that when we talked about the house of God. Now, because that is a reality, I'm already a member of the body of Christ spiritually. I don't need to relate with other believers. You know, sometimes believers end up with that kind of a thought process and especially when they are going through a season of discouragement they don't want to come to church they don't want to come and fellowship with others uh, they only think that i'll go when i feel nice or i'll go when some special programs happen but when you look at the kind of community that the uh, scriptures talk about he's saying that See, this, this whole thing of uh, a local body, a local fellowship, a local church, uh, he says, don't forsake the assembling of ourselves together. So, you know, you're fellowshipping together, you're coming together for worship. Uh, it, it, it will do something as far as strengthening you in the Lord is concerned, as far as encouraging you is concerned. So, 
let's not neglect it is his point. Okay. Uh, and now we will go on to a, a very crucial section, just like you do six. There is one more passage coming up uh, from verse 26 to 39. Uh, so should we go ahead with that or uh, any any thoughts so far? Okay, Kennedy is saying, uh, how and why did the Spirit affirm the eternal nature of Jesus Christ? What does this term, this man signify? Okay. So uh, which verse are you talking about, Kennedy? Verse 10. Okay, am I missing that? I don't think I can see the first step. Okay, um, I'm not um, quite able to locate that. Oh, okay, verse 12, verse 12. Susan has shared there. This man, after he had offered one sacrifice for sins forever, sat up. Yes, sir, can we, we could say that because we have seen earlier that uh, the author dealt with the deity of, of Christ and then the humanity quite elaborately. So unless he establishes that Jesus was fully man, he cannot, um, you know, uh, justify the fact that his sacrifice was accepted because we needed a human representative isn't it to to be our atonement uh, prize and so he has to emphasize on the fact that the lord jesus was a man so when we see that emphasis it is to uh, clarify and justify that sacrifice so that's how we would understand it uh, would that be fine Okay. All right. So uh, it's 9.50 now. Let's go in for a break. And uh, we will soon go into the faith uh, passage. And uh, we also need much faith to complete our portions. <laughs> and hopefully, you know, we'll do it and do it well. Um, so let's go in for a break. In 10 minutes, we shall be back. See you all at 10, 10 a.m. Thank you.